Hello and welcome to another Sunday School Lesson Review Broadcast for Sunday, December the 26th, 2021. And as this is the day after Christmas, I would hope that everyone had a Merry Christmas, a very Merry Christmas, and I hope that everyone remembered that Jesus was a reason for that day, that season. Season, Christmas season, everybody refers it to, but Jesus is a reason for it. Now, this lesson review was taken from Philippians, the second chapter, verses 5 to 11, and John, the 13th chapter, verses 12 through 17. And the title of the lesson is A Humble Lord is Born. And I am your host, Minister William Gadsden, and I greet you in the exalted name of Jesus Christ. You see, as always, it is Jesus that enables us to get the word of God out to you, the listening public. We originate from the Greater Peace Missionary Baptist Church, located in the Colleen, Fort Hood, Texas area. Our address is 4201 Zephyr Road, Colleen, Texas, 76543. You can reach us by telephone at area code 254 680 However, if you prefer to reach us online, our website is www.greaterpeace.com. And you can communicate with us by email. And our email address is greaterpeacemdc at peoplepc.com. Now, we at Greater Peace Missionary Baptist Church provide a variety of services for your Christian growth. A complete schedule of services and activities can be viewed on our website. So please join us in extending God's kingdom here on earth. And I am your host, Minister William Gadsden, and I thank God for you supporting this ministry. Now let us open our lesson with prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you. I thank you for this day, allowing me to see another day, Lord. I know it is because of you, your grace, and your mercy that I am well and have a reasonable portion of health, and I thank you for that, Lord. I just ask that you continue to go with me, that I may be able to continue to do your work, Lord in the fields while I'm down here. And I pray that those that are listening in would ask the Holy Spirit to guide, go with, come, invite the Holy Spirit into their hearts as we go through this lesson so the Holy Spirit can guide them. And I ask likewise, Lord, for myself that the Holy Spirit will be with me as I go through the lesson. I am again thankful for all that you've done for us. And I ask that you continue to go with us. In Jesus' name is my prayer. Amen. Now, the New Testament is divided as follows. The first four books referred to as the Gospels are dedicated to the teachings of Jesus to his disciples and the Jews in general. He came to his own to teach them these things, but they did not receive him. They denied him. Now, Jesus came to his own people, as I said, and the Jews to fulfill the prophecies about the coming Messiah, and he was the coming Messiah. But his own, the Jews, crucified him. But as Simeon declared in last Sunday's lesson, Jesus also came for the Gentiles as well. But he dealt with the Jews first. Now, after the gospel, the gospels in the book in the New Testament comes the book of Acts. We have the first four books. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then comes the book of Acts in the New Testament. And now the book of Acts, which is all about the Acts of the Apostles after Jesus ascended to heaven, as well as the conversion of Saul and his actions after he was converted by Jesus. Now, then after the book of Acts, then the epistles of, or books related to the teachings of the Apostle Paul as he traveled on his many missionary journeys to bring the message of Christ to the Gentiles are covered. Then the, after that, then the book of Hebrews, written by an unknown author, even though many feel that Paul it was written by Paul, however, there is no universal agreement on this by theologians. So after the book of Hebrews, uh, after the Paul's his, epistle, that is, of the Hebrews, we are introduced into the writings of James, who was a half-brother of Jesus, along with books written by Peter, John, and Jude, who was also a half-brother a half of Jesus, and he's also the brother of James. Now, finally, in the New Testament, the book of Revelation, of the revelation of John, was the apostle about the revelation Jesus gave to him 
as a final book in the New Testament, as well as in the Bible. This is a revelation that Jesus gave to John. And this basically tells us about the end times and what we can expect and how Jesus has planned it out, planned this, the end of this world out, this age, that is, not the world, because we will go into eternity after the millennium. But the Old Testament primarily concern, is concerned with God leading the children of Israel in prophecies about the coming Messiah. And as I said, Jesus was that coming Messiah. But the New Testament, after the gospel of Jesus, gospels, that is, of Jesus, Mark, Matthew, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, after those books, it is focused primarily on getting the message of Jesus to the Gentiles. And Jesus selected Paul to be the messenger to deliver that message to the Gentiles. Now, Acts, in Acts, the ninth chapter, verses 15 through 16, it tells how Jesus commanded Ananias to go to Saul, who later was called Paul, so he could receive his sight. And because Jesus declared that he will have to suffer much to deliver the word of salvation to the Gentiles and also the Jews. So this is what Jesus is telling Ananias to go and, and touch him so that he can see to receive his sight back. And the, those two verses read, but the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Now, in this lesson, the Apostle Paul is writing to the Philippians in the city located in Macedonia. That is the first section of this lesson. Paul is in Macedonia. Now, all of the previous lessons, except last week's lesson, began with the gospel of the New Testament. Now, the lessons in the gospels were primarily written to Jews. But this lesson begins with the teachings of the gospel of Jesus Christ to Gentiles by the Apostle Paul. And that book, we we're talking, as we said, it's from the book of Philippians. And it was basically Paul's letter to the people at Philippi in the region of, of uh, Macedonia. So that basically is the end of my uh, lesson. And I want to get now started into, uh, let's into, end my introduction. And now let's start with our lesson. The lesson title is A Humble Lord is Born. The lesson text is taken from Philippians, the second chapter, verses 5 through 11, and John, the 13th chapter, verses 12 through 17. Our golden text is taken from Philippians, the second chapter, verse 7. Verse 7 reads, But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. There are three sections to our lesson. First one is emptied. Philippians, the second chapter, verses 5 through 8, exalted. Philippians, the second chapter, 9 through 15. And third, humility in action. John, the 13th chapter, verses 12 through 17. So let's get started with emptied. We are to empty our minds and, and basically go with the words that Jesus has told us. Fill our minds with the words of Jesus so that we can be a followers of him in true fashion. So verse 5 reads, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, as I started, stated earlier, Philippians is the epistle to our letter Paul wrote to the Gentiles in the city of Philippi, located in the region of Macedonia. Now, the natural question one might ask in reference to this verse is, what mind is to be in us, which was also in Jesus Christ? The answer to answer this one this one needs to go back to a few verse, back a few verses in, cha in this chapter, to verses three through four. Christians should follow the principles of doing for others the things you would like to do for them to do for you. And even if they do not do the things you would like done to you, a Christian should still do unto others the things you would have them do unto you. As Christians, we should set our minds to think and do the things Jesus taught. Jesus taught many things that Christians should do. He taught that we should have a humble mind and that we should love the Lord and our neighbor as ourselves. So if we follow the directives of Jesus, we will be letting the mind of Jesus be in us. Now, verse 6 says, 
who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now, Jesus had two distinctive natures when he lived on earth. He had a human nature and he had a divine nature. Jesus did not give up his divine nature while he lived on earth. Now, Jesus stated that he and the Father are one. They think alike. Both he and the Father think alike. They agree on all things, and they essentially are one in the same. So, if Jesus and the Father are one in the same, it makes sense that the divine nature of Jesus did not change when he took on hum a human form here on earth. Jesus could claim his deity even though he faced limitations of his deity while he was in human form. Jesus in his human form could not be everywhere every time, at all times. We can call Jesus at any time and he can be with us anywhere. That may not have been the case when he was here on earth because he had human form, but he still was divine, had that divine nature. Therefore, since Jesus was in the form of God while on earth, he was still God as a man. Now, verse 7 reads, But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Now, Jesus was still God when he was here on earth, but he did not come to earth with his heavenly reputation. He came to earth as a servant. If he had come to earth in his rightful godly reputation, he would have had royalty meet him at his birth. And the Jerusalem temple should have been closed and all the Jewish leaders should have been present at his birth. But Jesus came with no reputation as to who he was. He was born in a stable with animals and the only visitors he had at his birth were, of course, Mary and Joseph and lowly shepherds. They were the ones that came to visit Jesus. Now later, Gentiles from afar came to bring him presents, the three wise men, because they realized that the true king now was with mankind on earth. The apostle Paul described the birth of Jesus as follows in Romans, the first chapter, verses one through five. Now, the, uh, the gospels do a great job in describing the birth of Jesus, but that was for the Jews. Paul is here is talking to the Gentiles who, who, didn't, who weren't there, didn't know, possibly didn't even have any idea who Jesus was. So Paul, in Romans, the first chapter, verses one through five, is describing the birth of Jesus. And he says this as follows, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle and set up apart from the gospels of, gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scripture regarding his son, who as of his earthly life was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead Jesus Christ, our Lord, through him we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. That is Paul describing the birth of Jesus as he saw it, as he was given that description anyway. And so as, we can, as can be seen because of who he was, that is Paul, he deserved, Jesus that is, he deserves to be met with pomp and circumstance. But instead, he chose to come in a different way as a servant. Jesus came here as a servant. But because of who he was, he could have come here with pomp and circumstance, but he chose not to. Now, verse 8 reads, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You see, Jesus came to earth as a human being for one purpose. That is to be a sacrifice for the sins of mankind. He never claimed his God and deity while here. And remember, God made this promise that he would send a savior for mankind, the sins of man, back in, uh, in, in, in uh, Genesis, the third chapter, verse 15. And this is that fulfillment, the birth of Jesus. Now, he fulfilled the prophecies that promised his coming. And he willingly died a cursed death on a, for our sins on a cross. So that concludes our first section. Now let's go to the second section. It's exalted. Jesus is exalted because of who he was, who he is, and who, what he did while he was here on earth. 
And that is verses 9 through 11 of the second chapter of Philippians. Now, verse 9 starts off by saying, Wherefore God also hath exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. You see, because Jesus willingly and obediently volunteered to do the will of the Father and die a death on a cross meant for criminals, God exalted his name and, and gave him a nature that is above every name gave him a name that is that is above every name throughout eternity. Because Jesus obeyed the will of God and basically became that sacrifice for mankind, the sin of mankind back in, in Genesis, God gave him that name and above all other names on earth. See, God exalted Jesus because he willingly allowed himself to be humiliated for the sake of mankind. And because of his sacrifice, God exalt, exalted the whole person of Christ, his deity or divine nature, as well as his humiliation while on earth cannot be separated because Jesus was born human and he was divine. Uh, because when one speaks about Jesus, it is impossible to separate what he did as a human and what he had and, what, and that he had a divine nature also. Now, Jesus is only one to sacrifice his life willingly for the sins of mankind. Now, verse 10 reads, verse 10 and 11, that is, that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, God rewarded Jesus for his services, service to mankind by proclaiming that everyone will someday, both in heaven, on earth, and below the earth, acknowledge Jesus by bowing at, the knee, at their knees. Now, not only will they bow to Jesus, but they will confess that Jesus is Lord. And these confessions will also glorify God the Father. Now, the atheists and all who deny Jesus today, as well as those in the past and future, will someday have to acknowledge that he is Lord and do so on their knees. Now, many, I think, will not want to acknowledge that Jesus is Lord, but they will have no choice in the matter because God the Father has said, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow to him at the appointed time and acknowledge that he is Lord of all. Now, that concludes our first two sections. Let's go on to our third section, which is back to the, the Gospels, the Gospel of John, and that is humility in action. Jesus was, his life, whole life was humility while he was here on earth because he came here not as a king, but he came here in humility as a servant. And that is what he did, humility as a servant. And this is an example of how he uh, gave his disciples the knowledge that he, he why he came here as in humiliation. So after he, verse 12 reads, after he had washed their feet and had taken his garment and was set down again, he said unto them, know ye what I have done for you? After he washed their feet, this is what he asked the question. Now in previous lessons, we witnessed Mary, the sister of Lazarus, anoint the feet of Jesus with an expensive ointment and then she wiped his feet with her hair because this was representative of Jesus' death on the cross. Now, Jesus is basically telling his disciples in, in a way that he is going to die on a cross also. And he wants to tell them about what they have to do when he leaves. Jesus is now about to wipe the feet of his disciples and let them know them in on the secret about him, that is. Jesus is teaching his disciples a lesson they will need to know about him because he knows that soon he will not have an opportunity to tell them, tell them this secret. Now, verses 13 and 14 read, then call, ye, that is, well, let me back up. He says, ye call me master and Lord, and ye say well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. Now, did Jesus really mean for us to wash the feet of everybody? Well, maybe, maybe not. Jesus says to his disciples, as he washed their feet, that as their, as their teacher, he is often referred to as master or Lord by them. 
But one does not expect a lord or master to wash the feet of those he is a superior to, because a master does not serve the servant, but the servant serves a master. And this is what Jesus was doing. Jesus was a master, but he was serving the servants, his disciples. Jesus then tells them that if he is their lord and master, then he is about to show them something that they will have to show to others. That is, they must do likewise to, for others by becoming a servant to others also. Not necessarily washing their feet, but basically being in service to those because of the death that Jesus gave. They are to, just, to go out and tell the world about Jesus. And they are not to be lord over them or be superior to them. They are equal to them. The, servants. They want to pass the word on to them, and not in a superior manner, but in the way Jesus said they did, because he's supposed to do it as Jesus had given them example. He is basically serving them, so when he leaves, the people, he had that, the disciples have to serve the people the way Jesus just did then by washing their feet. Now, Jesus tells them that he is washing their feet in order to show them that if he, as Lord and Master, over them wash their feet, then they must do likewise for others. Washing their feet was merely used to show them that they must be willing to lower themselves to do the things that are not commonly done by those in authority. Verse 15 and 16 read, For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. Neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. Now, the lesson Jesus wanted to leave with them was an example of what they must do when he departs. That is, they must be willing to do what is necessary to win the hearts of those who do not know him as Lord and Master, as well as Savior. Now, Jesus tells them that this is what they must do uh, for others. Now, our final verse in our lesson says, If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Now, Jesus tells them, If he has done this for them, then they must do likewise to others. That is, they must be a servant to those that are seeking the name of Jesus and accepting Jesus. Even though they accept Jesus, the disciples are not better than they. They are not masters over the, the, the people that accept Jesus. They are merely servants like they are, and they have to be, act in that manner. And it says, do likewise to others as I've done to you. Let them know, let them know that if they do these things, then they will be happy in knowing they are obeying Jesus. And in the book of John, Jesus told his disciples, says, you are my friend if you do what I command you. So Jesus has made this commandment. If you do these things, happy are ye, because you are my friend if you do these things. And that, my Christian friends, is our Sunday school lesson for this week. So let us close in prayer. Lord, I thank you for being with me as I've gone through this lesson. I praise you, and I give you the the greatest praise that I can ever do. I thank you for those that are listening in. And Lord, I'd ask the blessing be in be, be given them if it be thy will in the name in the way that you see and know that they need a blessing. I'm thankful for the things that you've done for me, the blessings you bestowed upon me, and I thank you for having the Holy Spirit for being with me. And Lord, I just thank you for all that you've done. And go with us, Lord, as we are, are headed into a new year. And if we see that new year beginning, guide us, Lord, to be better Christians in the knowledge that we gain this past year, through your word, I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.